Oh, support for the voice to parliament has sunk even further in the latest news poll. Here are the latest figures. Yes, down to 41%. No vote, climbing to 48 And among Liberal voters, the yes vote has fallen from 37% at the beginning of the year to just 21% today. Well, for more on this, let's bring in the Shadow Minister for Child Protection, Karen Little, who joins me from Adelaide. And Karen Little, thanks for your time. You must feel a long way towards defeating the Voice campaign after these poll numbers today. Well, I still am surprised that uh, we've got what appears to be something like 10 weeks before we're expecting that uh, the referendum will be held. And yet we're still talking about detail. And yet only last week, the Minister for Indigenous Australians came out and enlightened us with the four priority areas she would like the voice to actually focus on. And no surprises to anybody, health, housing, education and jobs. Um, I'm stunned that uh, we're so close. We've passed the legislation to enable the referendum and yet we're still getting detail, but I or wouldn't call that detail. What, are the de what exact detail are you after? Well, there's the Cal Melanchthon report, and that is actually a document that is some 270 pages. But when the government says, you've got the detail, it's already out there, it hasn't actually confirmed that it is actually going to endorse the recommendations in, in that document and how many of those recommendations are is actually endorsing for the voice to go forward. So there's not a lot of detail. People are still wondering. Uh, I get asked questions about, are people actually going to be appointed? Or are they actually going to be contested elections for people to actually participate? That has still not been answered. And I think they're very important questions for people who would see themselves as the voting um, part of this equation uh, after, um, after if uh, a referendum is successful. OK, we've got the yes and no pamphlets released tomorrow. What can we expect in terms of the no pamphlet? Well, I'm hoping that uh, people will read the pamphlets in detail um, and see what they've got to offer in terms of arguments and, and read both pamphlets because I think that when they see the no pamphlet, it will be the things that I have been talking about for quite some time, not just the lack of detail, but the separation of the two issues, one being constitutional recognition, the other being voice and the overreach that I believe voice actually is and that it's not necessary to be in the constitution. So I think all of those matters are important to put out there in the one document and to keep an open mind in terms of all of the additional information that might be provided to support the no position. Who's worked on the pamphlet? Well, the, the, my understanding is the people who have actually worked on the pamphlet. I haven't worked on the pamphlet myself, um, but it is the people who actually uh, were no uh, when the vote was taken in the House or in the chamber. Indeed. It doesn't seem a coincidence that people turned off the voice more the minute the prospect of it being bipartisan went out the window, does it? Well, um, I think when you understand the history of referendum, um, uh, an agreement and um, consensus is actually a, have been a really important part of successive referendum. So that is one issue. But then there's the issue of about the proposition itself, how it's been developed, uh, how it's been presented to the public and how this is actually rolling out. So I think there are a whole lot of reasons that make this a complex um, reason why people might say no. There might be a number of reasons that validate further a no position for them. You're of Indigenous heritage and yet we've spoken before, you're anti the voice. Can you explain to me what it is about the voice that, you, that offends you or, or that you fear? Well, the fundamental proposition for me is I don't believe the voice needs to be in the Constitution. So that, that's the headline position for me. And then there are the claims about what the voice will actually achieve. I've always held the position that it is uh, parliamentarians, both state, territory and Commonwealth. It is also bureaucrats. It is also program providers that should be uh, hearing from their customers, clients, uh, the issues that might affect outcomes and it is about accountability more than it is voice. Um, I go back to hearing from Linda Burney those four issues. They're not new. Nobody should have been surprised about those issues. So let's just get on with it and call for more accountability right along the supply chain of service delivery so we get improved outcomes. 
Um, I don't believe that having a bureaucracy that sits next to another bureaucracy is actually an appropriate way to get better outcomes. So it's not a fair income advisory body from your point of view. It's just going to be a bureaucracy, maybe with some Aboriginal politicians. Is that how you see it? Well, well, what we hear about regularly is Aboriginal people need to uh, be at the table. But the reality is when you actually uh, unpack what is happening already, the narrative out of the Commonwealth for some time has been about shared decision making, co-design, collaboration. The closing the gap uh, process has been all about this new invigorated uh, collective uh, engagement. The, we have a plethora of commissioners, advocates who are either of Indigenous heritage or focused on uh, in, uh, only on Indigenous peoples. And yet still we haven't got the progress that we actually need. I actually believe, yeah, you go back to accountability. I've not come through politics. Uh, I've not come through the political field. I've, I've been in politics for 12 months. Um, I've come from uh, the sector where I've actually been employing people. I haven't been an academic. I haven't been a public servant. I've actually employed many, many thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across a range of sectors. And I believe it's about economic participation. It's about driving out accountability and outcomes. That's what will get the change. And, and recognising that there are Aboriginal people who are significantly disadvantaged, who may need some additional supports to actually participate, not just in the economy, but also socially. And all of those things will, will result in better outcomes. It's not Karen about saying Little. to a group that sits... Um... Sorry, uh, sorry to yes. interrupt. I was just going to ask, were you disappointed when Peter Dutton gave Jacinta Price the Indigenous Affairs portfolio over you? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I've been uh, particularly interested in the area of child protection and domestic and family violence, having um, had an experience um, in my family of the tragedy of uh, domestic and family violence for any Australian family. And so this is an area I really want to focus on. A new senator for South Australia, I can do some great work in this area. Um, it's not a competition. I think we work very effectively together, both Jacinta and I, and I'm a great supporter of hers. So I'll continue to support her, continue to engage with her on those issues because there is connectivity between every single portfolio area um, that politicians work on, and that's the critical aspect, is making sure that we have voice across uh, all of those portfolio areas.